All right, welcome back. Yes, as you've seen right there, most Reverend Matthew Kuko joins us this morning. He's the convener of the Peace Committee. Good morning, and thank you for joining us this morning, Bishop. Well, quite interesting. Good to see you, by the way. Thank you um, very much. Well. I don't think yeah. that... Uh... Since, since I don't seven. <laughs> Yes, indeed, and uh, you know, doing bad for yourself and for the nation, I might add. But about the significance of this peace committee, uh, let's start off from there because this is different from the last time out. So, tell us about it. Why did you adopt this measure this time? Because if you read the full text of the of the of the peace uh, accord, uh, it speaks to two different issues. First, is uh, it spends a lot of time, you know explaining things that ordinarily people should know, but also rules of engagement, rules of conduct, very basic rules of civility that by now we shouldn't be talking about them, uh, but they still persist in our political system. But so that first part just tries to encourage politicians, you know, to, to, be, to respect one another, respect the rules of the game, also submit themselves and show commitment to collaborating and cooperating with state agencies and so on and so forth in order for this, this process to be smooth. The second part of the accord speaks to the issues of commitment to accepting the results of the elections. You know? So after you finish all this, it may be two days or three days to the, uh, to the elections themselves, they will sign the, 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 the second component, committing themselves to accepting the results of the elections if they are judged to be free, fair, and credible. Hmm. That's a huge one there because, um, wait, why did they have to wait to sign it afterwards and not in the same breath like this one? Well, no, I mean, let me say, again, maybe, maybe I should just take you back a little bit. Um, this peace committee was not supposed to have been here by now because um, when Kofi Annan, the blessed memory, uh, based on his experience uh, from the 20. 13 elections in, in Kenya, which went awfully bad, and the number of people that died. Um, they are, they are, in the Nigerian political horizon, there was this air of, you know, of gloom about the possibilities of, you know, all kinds of things going on in Nigerian elections. And of course, if you, if you recall, if you play the tape back, so many things had been expressed in 2011. And, um, so I was, I was someone by Kofi Annan whom I'd never met, although the conversation started with the Swiss embassy, uh, focusing on what kind of lessons might we uh, learn from Kenya and how can we make sure that those kind of things don't happen. So Kofi Annan and the late, I mean, uh, of blessed memory, and Chivemeka Anyoku, uh, someone me, I'd never met Kofi Annan before, you know. And we had a conversation at the Hilton, and I was quite humbled, you know, when they proposed that... Um, I should convene prominent Nigerians, you know, to be able to encourage uh, and to help us draw from an inspiration that we had had with a, with a, um, a conference that had been organized by Chief Benobi, which Emeka Anyoku had the, the, the honor of chairing. And if you remember, something very significant happened. It was unprecedented. And I can tell you how excited I was to open the newspaper and even to see on television General Buhari and President Jonathan hugging one another. It was, I mean, if you talked about a picture speaking a million words. So we then had to take advantage of that. And again, happily, President Jonathan had set up the office for inter-party affairs, which Chief Benobi was the chairman. And so that's what brought this about. So there was a signing of the what was called the Abuja Accord, but there was a clause that proposed the setting up of a Peace Committee for the 2015 elections. So the whole idea was for us to see whether we could help Nigeria walk through this landmine to be sure that the elections you know, didn't spin out of control. So after we succeeded in that, it was assumed that we should all go shake hands and go home. Uh, but we had, we decided, uh, you know, the chairman then decided, look, let's even have a debriefing among ourselves and say, what, what, how did we really feel? Um, and if you see the kind of people that we assembled, they were very busy people. And to just assume that after that, everybody will go home. But we, we spoke to the media. We spoke to civil society groups. We spoke to the board of trustees of PDP and APC. We went to speak with the, with, with the speaker of the National Assembly, uh, Honorable Dogara then. We went to the Senate president, um, 
Bukola Saraki, that honor uh, Senator Bukola Saraki was Senate president. We had a meeting with President Jonathan. We had a meeting with President Buhari, who had just been sworn in. And one and all across the board, everybody said, no, 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 the Peace Committee can do. You must remain, become part and parcel of this process. So this is how this journey has continued and brought us to where we are today. Mm. So um, this time around, you had the, the, the party chairman also part of the fray in an expanded session. So is it that uh, they have equally significant roles to play? Because if the candidates decide, look, yes, we are the ones here, but what role do you expect those party chairmen to play here? Well, let me, let me give you an example, you know, drawing from the, from the Catholic Church. And of course, let me say from, from Christianity, you know, when two people want to get married, you know, you have witnesses. Um, and they, 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 they're not the witnesses, even the priest, it's an observer of sorts, so to say, because it is the two people getting married who invite, who step forward and invite other people. So the party chairmen are important because they are more or less, you know, holding the post. Um, so they are more than just witnesses. They are pending their signature. It's an affirmation of the commitment of the entire party apparatus to submit to the principles that have been laid down. The, 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 the presidential candidates themselves have to sign. And that's why if you notice yesterday, um, it was the chairman of the APC that signed because uh, um, Ashwaju was not uh, present. So, um, and of course, there were three other parties that didn't show up for all kinds of reasons. You know, sometimes people start off all these things and then at the end of the day, either they lose steam or they step out. But on balance, you know, we had 15 uh, you know, presidential aspirants that showed up and uh, everybody appended their signature. So it's really a, to give it a sense of validation. So the party chairman of the APC signing, uh, would they have the same import as the, the candidates well, no, themselves? Our doors, our doors are open. If you remember, um, in the 2019 elections, um, uh, Elijah Tiku Abubakar was not available. And uh, then, of course, his political opponents began to exploit that by saying, ah, you see, he's not committed to peace. And we said, no. Uh, uh, my friend, um, uh, Obi Ezekweseli, who was also a presidential candidate, was not available. But that our doors still remain open. And uh, you know, Atiku Abubakar came to the Secretary of the Peace Committee, appended their signature. The same thing with uh, um, Ngozi, uh, Obi Ezekweseli. Um, so our doors are still open. And I told the chairman of the APC that much, you know, that if Ashiwaju comes back from his trip, our doors are open there. His, his signature space is still there. Okay, so this time they will sign twice. Uh, you, the second part being uh, agreeing to comply with the results of the elections if they consider it free and fair. So why go this way? Is it that the first model or method didn't achieve the no, kind the of first, results the you first, wanted? No, the first, let me, you know, we're very much encouraged, first of all, by the developments that have taken place in, uh, in, in INEC. And here I would like to actually commend the president and the National Assembly for the progress they've made so far uh, in signing the, 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 the act into law. Um, the president also has made commitment in his Onga speech, which suggests very clearly that Nigeria is committed to deepening democracy. The real challenge for us is to get the political actors themselves you know, to sign on to, because like I said, the first part is just a, a commitment to some of the very basic ingredients of politics and any form of human relationships. There are rules to every game. But as we can see, we have come from a very tortured past, you know, where people, and this is a country where people don't take the law seriously, uh, whether it's the constitution or whatever. And that we, our responsibility is, as I said, to, to, to ensure that the actors in the long run can suffer penalties. And these penalties should include, by any stretch of the imagination, a clear commitment that the things you sign for to cooperate with the civil, civil authorities, to obey the law, uh, to, 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 to make sure that you don't instigate violence. And I'm hopeful that going forward, if we have a tribunal or if we have a commission dealing with electoral offenses, that it will be possible. In my, this, for me, is, is, is a dream. I can speak you know, for the Peace Committee and indeed for all Nigerians that people must begin to suffer penalties. That you can actually have your presidential ticket, whether you win or you lose, taken away from you. You can have a, a gubernatorial ticket taken away from you because you've not played according to the rules of the game. I mean, you score a goal. The fact that there was a foul means yeah. the goal is unknown. So I think we must more or less, it's almost like a VR, you know, VR. <laughs> that's where we should be moving to because our people have shown absolutely no commitment to respect for rule of law. 
Well, that, that's a, an important component to consider moving forward. But let's bring in uh, Lagos. They've got questions as well. Uh, we, we really appreciate what you're doing, you know, um, Reverend. And it's, it's amazing that this is even happening, especially at this time and since 2014, which the National Peace Committee was set up and has been sustained. But the last, to the, uh, before I come to the question that I wanted to ask you earlier, so the last bit that you just spoke about, now it's very exciting for me, because we've been talking about um, a, an Electoral Offences Commission for quite a while. So are you saying that the document they sign could eventually be a kind of evidence in court to, for concerning whatever it is that they commit themselves to? Is it something that will be justiciable in the future? Is that what you're saying? I'm looking forward to that. You know, we cannot live in a country where people live by very fragrant disobedience to law. It's just not possible. And democracy focuses on rule of law and processes. And people cannot just sign on to these things, you know, and they get away with them without consequences. So that's why I'm saying I'm really and truly looking forward to a situation where the National Assembly itself, that is the beneficiary of these processes, and is also supposed to be responsible for legitimating processes by the quality and kinds of laws that we make. So yes, I mean, that is a goalpost we should be heading for. So that politics does not be, becomes more respectable, becomes more honorable. You know, there are too many, I mean, politics is the only thing, if you want to be a mechanic, you probably show evidence that you've learned your trade somewhere. If you want to be a teller, you have to show evidence you've learned your trade somewhere. If you want to be a lawyer, you have to show evidence. Now, politics is the only thing you don't need a qualification to participate in. The result is that, especially in the kind of environment that we live in in Africa, too many criminals have fil filtered and found their way into politics. So I think it is our responsibility and it, to create the kind of laws and environment that will make it very difficult for criminals to walk, to walk through this system. And that people cannot go away with a price that is tempted. And I think that uh, the late um, President Yaradu of, of, of blessed memory was honest enough, was honest enough from day one to say that I won this election but I am worried by the kind of price that I'm holding. And I will try and set up mechanism for making sure that we resolve these issues. And that's how I was lucky to have been appointed because I sat with Justice Uwais, you know, to look through all these all these distortions in the in the in you know in the law. So for me, that's a goal that we should all be headed for. Well the the, the other angle to that, you know, is that most of the people that form in trouble, they aren't the ones that you know, really sign the papers. As a matter of fact, what one would see is that most of the time, the conversation concerning the peace committee's uh, objectives don't generally drill down to the boys and the people, the girls who are the, the cannon fodders, if we can use that word, the people who go around campaigning for this, campaigning for that. So that's on the one hand. On the other hand, is the second is part of the issues that was raised by the chairman of the National Peace Committee about you know the social media, uh, fake news, and all of those things. How does that signing play on these two issues? Look, the signing is, in my view, is symbolic, but I think it's also a commitment to good behavior. Um, there's a lot of domestic violence going around. Uh, all the people, men and women who are involved in domestic violence, didn't sign on to that when they were getting married. You know, they signed on to certain levels of commitment. And like I said to people, and I said, you know, severally, elections are like a wedding. A wedding is not a marriage. A wedding is just a ceremony. Elections are just a process. And as we have seen, severally, they commit the promises that politicians make when they are campaigning. Um, take a completely different tone when they win elections. Uh, and this is why, you know, like they say to you when you enter a plane and the plane is about to land, you know, the, 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 the cabin crew will always tell you, you know, to be careful because luggage may have moved while the flight was on. So sometimes it is important that we understand that people make these promises. Very often they have no intention of keeping the promises. But it is our vigilance 
It is our collective vigilance to make sure that we hold their feet to the fire. That is why civil society cannot, we all of us cannot just be spectators. You know, we tend to assume that after we've elected these people, they will be of good conduct, they will govern us well. They've shown no, no, no inclination to anything of that sort. So it is, in, it is in our interest. The media, civil society, the judicial process, we must have the confidence to step up and challenge these people when, when if and when they go wrong. So if you talk about the small people in the system, Again, it is the, if you have an institutional capacity that gives you an opportunity to return to the scene of the crime and gather evidence. And this gathering of evidence means that you will have an opportunity to track and listen to stories of who did what. If a fire was lit in somebody's headquarters, who lit it? How did it happen? So for me, those are the issues. If you are not going to, the important thing is to create a deterrent and to have a deterrence culture. And people will know. You will never catch every criminal. But it must, the law must have, be of such quality that somebody knows that you cannot get away with this. And the day that somebody is pulled out of the National Assembly, and I think it has happened severally, um, the day somebody is pulled out of the National Assembly, pulled out of government house, on grounds of established evidence of malfeasance, that day people will begin to learn a lesson. And our democracy will continue to grow. And we can move away from this obsession of calling on religious leaders. Politics is not about moral appeal. It's about law and its enforcement. Uh, Bishop, first of all, good morning, and um, Bishop, accept all, my morning, belated yeah. wishes on your 70th birthday, and thank you for all that you do. I'd like to talk about a deterrence culture and holding the feet to the fire, but there's something just as interesting that I'd li like you to first of all react to, which is a comment from uh, one of the presidential candidates who said signing of peace accords show that uh, elections in, in this country are war. And I'd like to relate that to the fact that we don't quite see election observation, signing of peace accord, election monitoring in other countries that we uh, try to copy to adopt their models. But rather, it's done in Nigeria and some other parts of Africa, which suggests pretty much that uh, we can't put our house in order by ourselves. Does this worry you, Bishop? And if it does, what are your thoughts in that regard? Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, the, the, the portal is still open for the collection of birthday gifts, so the, the, those are not closed. Don't worry. We're still open for business. Noted, sir. Uh, but on a more serious note, look, I mean, let's, let's concede two things. The president delivered um, an address at, at Onga, and it's a fantastic speech. But it also speaks to the fact that he's not making excuses because we cannot be part of the international community and be involved in making excuses. Our, the quality of our democracy does not meet even local standards. That's the truth of the matter. We have operated in a very convoluted environment. Look at Kenya, for example. I mean, Kenya made a lot of mistakes, but guess what? I mean, Kenya already has, has only, what, five or so presidents since their independence uh, uh, on December 13, 1963. Um, uh, what's his name? Arab, no, no, sorry, not Jomo Kenyatta was prime minister for one year, then he became president. No, but look at, when you transport that to Nigeria, how many, we can't even call our president, we can't even spoke, speak about Nigeria's presidents because there is a convoluted vocabulary. There are presidents, there are heads of state, there are military presidents, there are heads of government. So we don't even, we don't even have that sequence in the conversation. So the point is that in every sense of the word, very few African countries have such a checkered past as Nigeria has. The series of military coups, the distortion of the political environment, the lack of commitment to law and due process, the inability of this country having a very steady uh, national assembly. Uh, the result is that we have we, we what we have today. So the National Peace Committee, in my view, is like a midwife. By now, we should have been out of the, of the way. For me, it's not, I, don't, I don't imagine that we will continue to remain embedded in the political processes of Nigeria. But the truth of the matter is that the Nigerian political elite have shown no commitment to the rules of the game of politics. There are too many people who just see politics as a transaction. Uh, just imagine an entry fee of 100 million naira to be able to buy a form. Imagine the huge amounts of money that people are asked to pay. You know, it's just like going to watch a match or going to a nightclub or whatever. If you charge that much fee, what are you going to expect you know, when you enter the hall? 
So we are now hearing stories of the problems of, of vote buying and so on. If, we enter, if it costs so much to enter the door, why would we expect anything less? So the Peace Committee is just a moral authority. We're encouraging our political class, but sooner than later, it is important that Nigerians take full charge of insisting on minimum conducts that, that are acceptable to us as a people. You know, because they, 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 what is going on in Nigeria in the name of politics, it, it falls far below the threshold. Mm. Well, uh, yeah, we, need, we need to go to break now, but um, we'll return. And then the last uh, the, the conduct between uh, former President Jonathan and the current president, we'll look at that scenario and how it played into what's going on today. But that will be when we come back in just a moment. Stay with us. Welcome back to Sunrise Daily. We are with Most Reverend Matthew Kuka, convener of the National Peace Committee. Bishop, now, in 2015, when uh, President Gulag Jonathan uh, you know, did call uh, now President uh, Buhari congratulated him. That, to a lot of people, that was a typology. That was a game changer to so many things that people had known before, the impression of how we had done things here before, in politics particularly. So would we uh, consider that scenario now a culture? Is it evolving into a political culture? Because to a large extent, that, that should be some kind of standard that we should be looking at. But how significant or how deep or where, uh, what kind of role does that play in the scheme of things? Now, the politicians now see that as at least the minimum standard that they need to comply with as a result of all of this? Uh, no, the Jonathan scenario is different. And, um I don't want to say they don't make them like Jonathan anymore because they are, it's, it's about character. Um, and I think Jonathan's advantage was, apart from his own personal conviction, um, he came from a background that didn't threaten anybody. And I say this because hegemonic politics, which is the politics of dominant groups, whether they are ethnically based or whether they are, they are religiously based, whichever way they conceive their hegemony, has consequences. So when you want to break away from that, it has consequences. So the Ijos didn't threaten anybody. They had no created a hegemony. Now, if a president from northern Nigeria, and you only need to do is to push back and see the nature of the debate and the argument from northern Nigeria since Jonathan, or even after the end of, uh, of um, uh, Yaradua's term, oh, it's our turn. We didn't finish our turn. Um, most of that conversation is still playing out today. Um, and I think that uh, President Jonathan's significance lay in the fact that he contested an election. Okay, it wasn't as if he was like Buhari, he didn't have any chance to have another term because that induces a certain kind of behavior that is not the same with when you are contesting. So John, what Jonathan did, the significance is profound. But, and I'm not beatifying him, but I'm also just saying that um, you can trace the, the, the trajectory. So if you were, let's say, a northerner or somebody from the southwest, let's say the Yorubas, the Igbos, the, 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 the House of Fulani, or by whatever name, all these hegemonic blocks sometimes will not allow you to, to give up power because of the benefit, you know, the benefits that accrued from an entire group of people. But as I said, to answer your question, it comes down to what kind of conviction do people have? And Jonathan made the point, and it's an eloquent testimony, that my ambition is not worth the blood of any citizen. Now, we have a, we have a, a system in which, for many politicians, there is no limit to what their ambition can, as long as it is realized. So I don't, I think, you know, Nigerians are always quick to score themselves. We, we are far away from, we have not even come anywhere close to that. Otherwise, we will not be having this conversation because people would be saying, well, the North, you've had your turn, or this group, you've had your turn, but that's not where we are at in Nigeria. And because, again, like I said, you know, Niger the Nigerian political environment is peculiar. It's not like any other. This is not Kenya. This is not Senegal. This is not... This is Nigeria. We are stealing of resources 
and thieves are hiding in plain sight. Where people show you very clearly, you are not expected to enter this political room and come out empty-handed. So we are corruption, and what, you know, we are saying that we are running out of resources in Nigeria, but there is still a lot to be stolen. If they are wearing, all these people who are running around and want to, want to govern us, it's not enough for us to ask what have they been doing with their life. But it is that this is politics of access. So, and the access when it comes to Nigeria is completely different because the Nigerian president, at the end, on a good day, has the powers that no president in the world has. I don't know whether the man in China has those kind of powers, but that is just that you can assign so much to an individual by just a stroke of the pen. Are you answerable to anybody? Absolutely not. There may be institutions that pretend that they are answerable to, but. It's not the case. So you can understand why the Nigerian system is so, you know, so much convoluted and will not admit of these kind of things. So Jonathan signposted a possibility. But I don't think we can assume that we have come to a point in which the Nigerian politician is ready to stand back and say, no, this is the way it should go. All right, let's bring in guys from Lagos again. All right, uh, Bishop, let's now talk about the culture of deterrence. Uh, you know, it is often said that the morning shows the day and... Uh, we can just pick a few examples from the consequence of uh, the conduct of primaries in the main political parties and look at the language, you know, of exchange between uh, the political actors. We can also look at, uh, uh, you know, the conduct of the off-cycle elections where there, were vo there was vote buying reported and still we have not seen any significance in terms of prosecution of those who were found wanting. And only recently, you know, the commission also talked about about how some political parties have overshot their spending limits, but yet refuse to name those political parties. How does this, um, what does this portend rather for uh, the peace accord that has been signed and what may be the conduct of the politicians in the 2023 elections? Well, I think, it, first of all, it's important not to ascribe to the Peace Committee powers it doesn't have. It's not a body that is set up by law. I mean, it's just a group of respectable Nigerians who only exercise a certain level of moral authority. They are, we cannot replace moral suasion. It's not a substitute to law. It's not enough for priests. And we've been shouting all, you know, priests and imams have been shouting about do not steal, do not steal. But that's all we can do. We, we, you know, we can't follow anybody to the bank with the proceeds of their loot. It is really the, the, the kind of architecture of, 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 uh, of consequence that is on the ground. That's what matters. But as we are seeing, even the judiciary itself, that is supposed to be the hope of the common man, as is always said, has, not, it has become encumbered with all kinds of characters who approach the courts with all kinds of frivolities. Uh, we have seen even a tendency to embed fake judicial processes in the political system. Um, so the point to make is that, look, um, people talk about institutions. And again, Kenya has given us a very good example uh, about institutions such as the judiciary and their capacity and their ability to deliver. But the fact of the matter, I'm sure if you speak to the people in INEC, they will tell you how inundated they are with frivolous court cases and so on and so forth. How to weed that out of the process and allow uh, INEC and other institutions to focus on what they were called upon to do, that's the challenge. You know, so it, it's, um, it, you must take the Nigerian political system with a very convoluted, corrupt uh, system that is Nigeria today. How you walk through all that is not a child's play. And we must not put our goalposts so much within our sights because it's going to take us. This is this is a very very long journey that we are going to you know um, participate in. It's not something that one government can pretend it wants to resolve because the problems have become so embedded and the corruption is of such depth and magnitude that it's not about one political actor just hoping and praying that he's going to fight corruption as we had and as we now see. So we just have to continue to renew our commitment and our energy to this process. And like I said, and that politicians will come close to even what ordinary Nigerians themselves uh, have in terms of their commitment to democracy. Well, Reverend, uh, all of these things that you have said, I mean, you, you've spoken quite copiously and confidently about the need for us to do certain things right. But you know, the constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria asks, is it currently is, 
share some ethos with the National Peace Committee. Um, for instance, uh, the National Pledge, National Anthem, they all talk about peace and unity and all those things. And there are things enshrined in the Constitution at all, uh, uh, it, uh, itself. But it would seem as if uh, the Constitution says some things, and you've spoken to the fact that people, some people are just generally you know, lawless and all of that. But then, on the one hand, the Constitution says this. On the other hand, it will seem like people are behaving exactly at variance with the very things that they swore to do. Is there a way, in your opinion, where we can institutionalize peace, institutionalize development, institutionalize good governance, so that the moment you get into office, you don't need to be told, you don't need to be cajoled. In fact, the moment you show interest in politics, these things are supposed to be sine qua non in your life, it ought to be seen. Is there a time or a way that you see that in this nation, peace is institutionalized, development is institutionalized, good governance is institutionalized for posterity's sake? Um, <laughs> I'm laughing because um, the assumptions you have about peace are not real. Uh, remember that the only reason why the devil is here is because they fought the war in heaven. Um, we will never attain that set of peace because if that is the kind of peace you want, then you go to the graveyard because there's nobody to say anything. As long as human beings exist, look, I mean, I always tell people, if in your house you have your first child is five years, another one is two years, another one is one year, by eight o'clock or nine o'clock, the house is quiet. But when your children are 20, 17, 15, you cannot tell them, stop watching television, it's time for bed. They'll tell you, no, daddy, I want to finish watching this cartoon. It's a bargain, it's a negotiation. Look, peace is not, it's not, peace is not a destination. I mean, in a way, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a point you just say you're going to attain uh, a kind of nirvana, you know. It's not, it's not like that. It would be an extraordinarily boring life if we didn't have, then where, what would the courts be doing? What would the police be doing? This is who we are as human beings. So the question is, how do you regulate the ring in a way that there are penalties? Uh, they say in Hausa, uh, what is the difference between boxing and fighting? Um, it is that with fighting, somebody says you can bite. But with boxing, as you saw with uh, Mike Tyson, you buy somebody's ears, he had to be fined $3 million. The question is, what are the consequences for bad behavior? And secondly, when victims of bad behavior experience their victimhood, where can they go to? The British set up in the 80s what they call a commission for racial equality. And I've been saying, we have a National Human Rights Commission, but the National Human Rights Commission probably just, it's a bureaucracy. So it's probably waiting for people to write petition and allege all kinds of things. But it is that we need a platform, we need a visible opportunity where people can say, look, I have, this is what, I've, this is what has happened to me. This is how the redress I seek. So people will know peace if they can go through a process that hears them out. So it's, I think we're really responding to the whole question of what kind of institutions do we have in place and what are the consequences for bad behavior. You will never, people drive badly everywhere in the world. But it's only in Nigeria that you drive badly and you, you can actually slap a policeman for daring to, to, to question you for driving badly. Elsewhere, because as you see, when Nigerians travel out of the country, they don't have a choice but to behave. So the question is the weakness of the architecture, of state architecture that we have that are so severely compromised that instead of the rule of law, what you have in Nigeria is the rule of men and women. So the result is caprice, and is the result of the volatility we have in the system, where there's just so much stress day in and day out. But as to as for a situation in which you'll just enter a door and everything is in peace, it's not going to be possible, and it won't happen. It will not be us as human beings. Well, clearly, a lot will be dependent on uh, INEC and the police to ensure that they play a huge role in these elections. But what is your impression about the turn of events for, in the build-up to these elections, having seen the way the registration, the latest voter registration has gone, the uh, participation, the interest in the part of the young people this time? Look, you know, frankly, like I said, and I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I wish that the politicians were half as enthusiastic, one, about this country, 
one about this democracy as we ordinary Nigerians are. Um, they will go with the price. But I think that what we are also seeing, and it's new, and it's also one of the things that played out in Kenya, we have to figure out what to do with the energy of these young people. First of all, they're not just young. It's not a biological issue. It is that people are properly pretty well wired. They know how the world is set. They know about the possibilities. Okay? And like you had a little girl speak yesterday in her speech. He said, look, by our time, when I'm president in 2050 or so, I'm not going to be going around with 200, I mean with, with 20 drivers because there will be no drivers. It is that, look, um, the young people will set the pace. And it is a question of looking at the mirror and asking ourselves, when is enough enough? Uh, when are we going to be able to have a sense of respect for ourselves? And victims of domestic violence, I mean, in the Catholic Church, they, we, we say that marriage is, 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 is indissoluble, that it cannot be dissolved. But if a woman comes to me with a battered face and say, I cannot tell her to go back and stay because the Bible says you must stay married. It, marriage must give you certain kind of... So the, 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 the embedded sense in this transaction of politics that I do this and this is what I get in return. We cannot be voting and be dying while you and your children are smiling all the way to the bank and traveling across the, the length and breadth of Europe. It is not possible. It will have consequences. And I think that that energy of young people and the, ordinary, the enthusiasm we've seen, those 95 million voters must now say to themselves, look at themselves in the mirror and say, what am I worth? What kind of life do I want? I'm not listening to the promises of these characters. I'm not interested in what they're pretending they represent. I'm not talking about their past. I'm talking about the future. So it's not a question of what this guy is promising, but I'm also asking myself, given the, the, the opportunities that I have, given the quality of education that I have, who gives me, I'm not asking for jobs. So don't tell me about jobs. I'm just asking for a space that can enable me to thrive. That's why the president's speech in, on, the, on social media on Onga was very interesting, because he, make, he admits that technology sets limitless frontiers, and technology actually moves faster than the human imagination. So a lot of these people who are in power, they don't understand tomorrow. They have no idea about what the future looks like. They're just thinking that nepotism, their children, their wives, their mistresses, and that being in power is about being surrounded. Times it's have not, it's not, it's not going to be. Times have changed. Yeah, well, a very fine place to let it go. Most Reverend Matthew Kuka is the convener, a National Peace Committee. Thank you very much. Thank it was you. a pleasure to have you on. Thank you, Chamberlain. Thanks for having me. All right, we will be back in a moment here. Stay with us.